You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hey, boys and girls. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 1, page 112. This is Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. We're your hosts every week or so with another fiction story that you submit to us. That's right. This week, our story is Silver by Tad Callen. Tad is an Arizona native currently living with his wife and four kids in the Baltimore area. He has been a music teacher, telemarketer, truck driver, carpet cleaner, Air Force linguist, hotel clerk, shuttle pilot at the hotel, and now works on computers for the government. Tad enjoys writing and blogs at tadshappyfuntime.blogspot.com. He also enjoys blowing his 9- and 11-year-old's minds with the classic science fiction and fantasy that he grew up with. This is his first published story. Silver by Tad Callan. Something was wrong, but you couldn't quite figure out what it was. You were hiking through the black forest following those leads. The girl who reported the sighting may not have remained a virgin, But that didn't mean that her story was false. It just meant that the experience would never happen to her again. You were still pure, however, and your hope and faith made you a beacon to draw them, if they were there, if they wanted you, but something was wrong. Her description was flawless. Everyone gets the pure white coat, the flowing mane, and that damned horn. But she knew the details. She heard them speaking their names. Names you recognized. Names you first heard when you were a young girl and you wandered away from your family's campsite on that trip to the Black Forest. And she saw the tattoos and the scars, which brought you back out there with your gear and your plans. This time, you were determined to get the proof that you needed. It had gone beyond an obsession, long before your job was lost and your reputation was gone. Certainly, you wanted to put a stop to the snickers and the pity. But this desire was older than that. It was much more than that. You had given up on that dream of proving yourself to doubters early on, and you learned to pay lip service to their disbelief so they would believe you had recovered your senses. The doubters couldn't help you get what you wanted anyway. It was that desire to see them again, to touch them, to ride one of them again. That desire kept you alone and intact throughout your adult life. It kept you aloof and distant, focused on your career. Your success as an interrogator was attributed to that detached focus. But in hindsight, your whole life was a balancing act between lies that hid your obsession and the truth that smoldered beneath, like embers hidden by wet leaves. No one could lie to you. You could smell the feeble smoke of their falsehoods and fan the truth into flame. On the interview tape, you were different, though. The girl's story was feeble. It was plain they had stolen that car and headed for seclusion. You were your usual, competent self cold and taking notes, waiting for the holes in the tail that would inevitably show themselves. She veered from the unlikely into the fantastic, telling you of the sound of hoofbeats and the flash of silver through the trees. You froze at that. Your detachment melted away. You ought to have torn her lies apart right there, exposed her fraud and closed the case. And yet you listened, and instead of cutting apart the lies with logic, you asked for more. Where did you go? What did you see? How many were there? Can you describe the marks? You wrote down everything, squeezing her for details until the chief came and ended the interview. They took the girl away, and you screamed at them to stop. You needed to know more. The tape captured your frenzy and the words that you were shouting, words that couldn't be heard on replay because no two listeners heard the same sounds. They detained you and made you wait for the chief's decision. You simply stared intently, stroking a lock of your silver hair which had fallen out of your normally severe bun as you clutched your notes and eyed the maps on the walls of the station. They took away your badge and your car. They revoked your investigator's license. After the magistrate reviewed your case, they were going to offer you a small pension and a quiet, 
part-time desk job at some village in the southern part of the country. It was strange that you had become so intent that you lost your control. If you had stayed calm, you could have interviewed the girl again later. You could have taken your notes and pretended not to believe her. You could have held on to the dignity and respect of your peers. Would that have made a difference? You went alone, with the illegal gun you'd found during a drug raid, and a pack full of modern camping gear, microfiber bedroll, piezoelectric generator, and basic protein sequencer. You went with no radio, no GPS, and no phone, but you took a long, thin silver chain and wore it coiled off your belt. You wore the night vision goggles, but didn't really believe those would help you. It was your blood they would smell, and they would find you, or they wouldn't. You wandered, uncertain for the first time in your life. Something was wrong, but you couldn't figure it out. You could only roam through the woods, clutching your hopes as they wilted into doubts. And then... As you approached a stream, they surprised you. They appeared out of nowhere, surrounding you and pinning you where you stood on the road. A ring of tall white equines with their long, thin horns, forming spokes that seemed to emerge from your body and radiate out to their foreheads instead of the other way around. You knew that a distant part of you felt fear. The old, weary part of you felt that, but it was far away, and it was sinking beneath the waves of joy that were radiating from the young, innocent virgin still within your heart. The joy of a faith long held and now rewarded. The joy of anticipation fulfilled on a wedding night after a protracted engagement. This was what you felt, even before they spoke to you. But they did speak to you, and if you had swooned when they did, swooned as you had all those years ago when they came upon you, lost and afraid, they would have escaped you again. This time, though, you were ready with your silver lasso, and you revealed to them your secret. You reminded them why, for so many centuries, they had avoided wise, older women who wandered through the forest in favor of those innocent, young virgins. As quickly as they had appeared, they were gone, scattered like brilliant aspen leaves, first shimmering silver, and then flipping into the dark green that dominates the trees of the forest, giving it its name. All but one, which strained at the end of your chain, trying to flee. You leapt upon his back, chain coiled around your fists, fingers balled into his mane. He was not the same one you rode in your youth. That time, you'd found yourself astride a young stallion with a pattern of swirls that wove around his middle in the shape of a saddle. This time, you were riding their king. No swirls on this back, no hint of domestication. This skin was covered with the story of their kind, tales of their migrations across time, their conflicts with other creatures, the flood that ended their rule. Scars told of the battles that followed, the encroachment of humankind. And one symbol on his shoulder where the pommel would be. This you recognized as the seat of their power. You caressed it with a finger, risking your grip to ride one-handed. This tattoo on the back of their king was the key to their continued existence. This symbol was the meme, the idea which kept them alive in the hearts of the world. It kept them anchored despite their secrecy. You should have let it go then. You would have been filled with their magic, returned to your golden youth. Nothing could have harmed you until you let it, and no one would have doubted you with the knowledge that you held. Instead, you wanted too much. You wanted to be seen in the city, riding triumphantly upon the king of the unicorn. You believed that nothing could harm you, though you ought to have realized the danger. The meme that had revealed itself to you should have filled you with their caution. But hubris is not a trait of the unicorn. It belongs to us and to you. And so you rode him to the city, where you were able to charge to the center square, a highway choked with fools and machines. And when you stopped, you dismounted, holding on to his chain, expecting all eyes to be on you and on him. You honestly believed that the world would stop and take notice. Most did but certainly not all. The humble car should not be enough to kill the king of the unicorn, but he is a creature of magic, and it is a creature of iron. It was simply unfortunate that the car struck him from behind, and that you were in front of him, arms upraised and shouting for attention. When the horn pierced you, it lifted you off the ground, and the weight of the beast carried you both over a wrought iron fence, yet more iron, and into a fountain. The horn snapped off at the very base when it struck the stone, leaving it in your body. The unicorn fell away, and a mighty flash of silent, 
heatless light blasted from his forehead. By the time the authorities arrived, the water of the fountain was a dark red. The blood and moss had obscured whatever strands of white were left in his coat, which had mostly turned to a dingy gray. The horn had remained, but as a charred and blackened stick, and the proof he wanted so badly was reduced to the sooty shaft through your torso, a dead horse in a fountain, and the uncertain memories of witnesses who had barely noticed the event. They took your statement, for whatever it is worth, capturing your last breaths on tape. Legally, it will be inadmissible. The pain and trauma would have robbed your credibility even if they hadn't given you the painkillers. But it has been transcribed and notarized for the public record. Reading it, one could assume only that you had broken from the strain of police work. No one would believe the tale you told in this age of miracles and wonders. Not that anyone will ever read it. Such a humiliating incident is certain to be buried as deeply as possible. As will you and the king of the unicorn. Author's Note Hi, this is Tad Callan, author of Silver. This story came about because of a writing exercise thread posted in the Escape Artist Forum. Roni suggested three topics and invited the rest of us to pick one and write a 250 to 300 word story to share with the group. The topics were an embarrassing encounter with a unicorn, an execution told in the second person, and first contact the transcript. I thought it would be fun to try to do all three, and I ended up with a lot more than 300 words. For me, stories are my unicorns. I bide my time waiting for them to come to me, and when they do, I hold on for all I'm worth and just try not to get killed before getting what I want out of them. I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. If you need me, I'll be in the forest following those leads. Okay, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the story, everybody. That was Silver by Tad Callen. Thank you, Tad, for sending us that story. If you would like to contribute to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction magazine, send us a story in the body of an email to submissions at dunesteve.com. That's where you'd send that. Please make sure you uh, check out our submission guidelines before sending a story out. And where can they find those, Big Anklevich? It should be right on the website at dunesteve.com. Thanks, man. And if they have any questions or suggestions or, or hate mail, uh, where can they send that? They send that off to editor at doonsteve.com, or they can just leave a comment on the blog. There's a person or two that has done that. We do appreciate our one listener. Yes. He gets handsomer every week. Big Anklevich, can you have your robot omit that last thing that I said? I mean, sometimes I say embarrassing things and, and you don't cut them out, but he will, right? Right, he always does. Okay. That's what I tell him to. You know, Big Anklevich and I really enjoy recording these stories. Uh, we enjoy reading the stories that you submit to us. And if you enjoy listening to them, might I suggest that you drop us a donation? We've got a button right there, a uh, PayPal link to give us a big donation or, or a small one. And... Uh, I was going somewhere, but it, uh, it's gone. Oh, it looks like the light's flashing. 080T, can you pull up the mail there? Oh, it's, it's our, our little Android. Hi, hey, how you doing, 080T? Hello? I... Hey, how, how, how are you doing? Are, are you feeling all right? Are you... Nothing. Is he on? Is he plugged in? Come on, be nice. I talked to you about this already. Come on. It's time for the hate letter of the week. Hey, look, if it's another hate letter, I... dude, this—I don't think this is a hate letter. I, this looks like a, dude. This is a compliment, man. Hold on, let me let me read this. It says, uh, "Dear sirs, I have listened to your podcast for a couple of weeks now, and I must admit that I was oh, that I was less than impressed. The stories weren't bad, but your vapid impressions of insightful or even amusing conversation." Always fell flat in my ears until today. Oh, wait. Here's the good part. Oh. I listened to your reading of Raising Archie, and I'll be the first to confess that I found your attempts at a British accent to be truly hilarious. It was with tears running down my cheeks that I laughed my way through the rest of your podcast until I needed to think about the Holocaust to wipe the grin from my face. So I thank you for the funniest podcast in recent memory. Keep up the good work. 
good in quotation marks. Yours, Nigel J. Westerly Esquire. Well, at least he didn't mention me by name. Yeah. Oh, hey, keep those cards and letters coming, folks. Okay, so uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about something that's uh, become near and dear to our hearts, although a few weeks ago it couldn't really have been because it's very newly hit the scene. We, are, of course, are talking about Joss Whedon's most recent project known as Dr. Horrible's Sing Along Blog. Which you can find at www.drhorrible.com. That's right. And I'll even have 08OT include a link to that site on our show notes. Hey, it's Go a good job, Dave, 08OT. <laughs> what, what did that mean? Uh, that didn't sound uh, like thank you. Or... Yeah, it's, I don't know, maybe you should do something nice for him that'll win him over. I don't know. ha, 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 ha. This was a uh, brainchild of Joss Whedon during the writer's strike of uh, the end of last year, early this year, where he was just trying to come up with some kind of format where you could get the entertainment out there without having to go through the same channels that make it so difficult, uh, such as the Fox Network. <clears throat> right, without having to go and grovel before a studio to get uh, your stuff distributed. And he figured, shoot, why in the heck, after, what, 15 some odd years that uh, the Internet has been widely available, why has nobody made good use of that? And so... They figured, let's make a, a little something-something, and we'll just make it available to everybody for free on the Internet. I think the idea was that you use the Internet to get recognition, to get it on everybody's minds, and mm -hmm. then people will pay for it later, uh, either from word of mouth or just from right. the fan base. And you don't need a studio. You don't That's need right. a theatrical release. You There's, don't need I mean, a they time have slot. It, they have it available on iTunes. For purchase, and you could get the whole show for, I think, $4. Like dollars. Oh, sweet. I'm going to have to do that, I think. And it is available on there for free again. Uh, it was, they, they only had it available for a week, then you had to buy it, and then out of charity or love or compassion or one of those other things that I don't have, they put it on there for free again. Yeah, I think they got some kind of a sponsor to uh, underwrite that somehow. So, yeah, there's a little example of that whole put it out there, get it on people's minds, and when they see that it's successful, people pitch in money, and pretty soon you'll make your money back. You know, the interesting thing is they talked a lot about that when we went to Comic-Con and we went to the Dr. Horrible panel, and they talked about that whole deal, and I was thinking about that, and sure, Joss Whedon can throw something together and put it out on the Internet, and he's already got legions of loyal fans that will snap up whatever thing he has to put out there but if big anklevich and rich outfield put together dune steve productions and put something out there available for download on the internet is that is it really a viable option do you think for for things like that to be or maybe that's i mean i guess that might be what youtube is already i mean there's people who make things they put them on youtube and Eventually, they've got, you know, one of my favorite things to watch on YouTube is the I'm a Marvel and I'm a DC. Not and that bad. guy's got four million some odd views of his various shows. So maybe oh. that's uh, the way uh, something like that happens. I don't know. I told you a little bit about that Internet show uh, called Sock Baby. Right. And how it was just done for almost no money on the Internet. And with each installment, the viewership grew until at this past Comic-Con... They actually had the world premiere of, of installment four of Sock Baby up there on a big screen with hundreds or thousands, I, I didn't get to go to it, of fans. But back to Dr. Horrible, it, uh, it's about a 40-minute presentation, uh, mm -hmm. three acts. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like uh, three episodes of a very short TV series. Or one episode of an hour-long show. And it tells the story of... Dr. Horrible, played by Neil Patrick Harris, of Neil Patrick Harris fame, who... Uh, NPH fame. Of NPH fame, that's good. <laughs> who is a, a rather unsuccessful supervillain attempting to rule the world, basically. 
At the same time, he's got the object of his affections, Penny, who's this girl that he sees at the laundromat a couple of times a week, and uh, he's trying to win her heart. And, and his nemesis, Captain Hammer, played by Nathan Fillion, the great Nathan Fillion, folks, uh, who's just always there to foil his plans and uh, basically be a tool. Oh, uh, yeah, he was kind of a tool. Anyhow, it's, it's funny, and uh, it's got several songs. Yes, it's, it's a musical supervillain love story. That's, that's, that's not bad. <laughs> Once they start into the songs, you're just like, wow, I really like this. And, yeah, that's the funny thing is you and I found ourselves singing the songs all through Comic-Con. We'd just be <laughs> walking along, and uh, what was it, what was it that we'd day. say? And it's like, with my freeze ray, yeah. I will stop. The world, and, and it was just one of those things. We couldn't get it out of our heads. And we got to go to a screening where they had it projected up on the wall with a big audience and all these people. And, uh, yeah, it was just amazing how many people in such a short time. It had only been in existence for seven or eight days. But how many people loved it by that point and knew the songs yeah. way better than how you How many and I people had. were dressed up? Oh, yeah. As Captain Hammer or Dr. Horrible or whoever. It was... Unbelievable. <laughs> Not a lot of bad horse costumes, though. I... The Thoroughbred of Sin? Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, at the panel, they did say that they were going to do future installments, or that was always the plan. So who knows what this could become. It's possible that somebody could call Joss up and say, hey, we want to do this as a real series. Yeah, on their website, they have various articles, and one of the articles was you know, an interview with Joss and all the rest of the people, and they said that some people have come to them, they want to make a feature film out of it. There's various ways that they may take it, and who knows. But yeah, they definitely said there will be more Dr. Horrible to come, so I'm excited for that. You know, they, they say that sometime around holiday season, we will be seeing a DVD. And they even had some cool things. They were saying that uh, they were going to do a contest where <laughs> they can have people uh, send in pretend uh, Audition auditions tapes. for the Evil League of Evil. And we were trying to think up uh, our best audition for that. So who knows? You may well see Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich on the DVD. Probably not. <laughs> but who knows? <laughs> Knowing us, we won't ever get around to it. Uh, but it's a good day to be homeless. No. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> That's good stuff. We'd like to encourage you, John Smith, at 223 Crescent Circle, to visit that site. Watch the show. Head over to iTunes and purchase the, uh, the whole program if you'd like. They said at Comic-Con that the soundtrack should be available soon, which I'm definitely going to be getting a hold of. As you would have guessed from our plague of being unable to stop singing the songs. I, I don't hate musicals, but I'm not a musical guy. I don't go out to watch musicals normally. So if I'm going around singing the darn songs all the time, then they must have been good. What, what do you think it is about Joss Whedon that inspires such fanatical loyalty? Well, he doesn't let you down. All the stuff of his that I've seen... It's, it's, it's got everything. And I think one time you, you talked about it with me when you were saying that he will do the things to his characters that makes you believe that they're in real danger. You know, characters that we love suddenly die so that you... You know, there was a certain point when I was watching Serenity that I figured that he was, everybody was going to be dead by the end of it. I was just like, oh, that's how he's going to do it. He's just going to massacre the whole bunch. Inside of that, the dialogue is always so really fresh and fun. And uh, it's really interesting, and it's the kind of stuff that you can quote to your friends for years to come. And uh, then on top of that, he always puts in a whole lot of pathos or whatever it is. You know, there's, there's real feeling. You feel a lot for these characters, and you can tell that these characters feel a lot for each other. You know, it's just something really special. I mean, he puts together some really good films, so good reason to be uh, that rabid fan base. Surprising that he yet has not been able to, maybe he doesn't want to, but he hasn't done much of a jump out of TV into film. You know, all, all he really needs to do is be given the reins to one of those films like Wonder Woman, which he 
I had the reins and then lost them. But something that would be a big summer blockbuster and suddenly there'd be bazillions of fans instead of that small, rabid fan base. That's something I've always thought about is if Wonder Woman had been a big hit or if Dollhouse were a huge hit on on the level of like the X-Files when it started or something, I I think that suddenly we would see Ripper and we would see Serenity 2 and we would see all this other stuff. Uh, because it's money that makes those wheels turn. Yeah, what 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 you say goes completely. And uh, at that dollhouse panel, one of the questions that was asked of him was, "Which character are you going to kill first? And do you remember what he said? Uh, his answer was, "The one you like the most." <laughs> and that's really the way Joss is. Uh, I guess we're so used to seeing people take the easy way out yeah. and to see everybody be okay at the, the end and brush themselves off or not even have to brush themselves off. And it's like, ooh, yay, happy because of test screenings or because of executive decisions and, and all this. That when you see somebody not make it through, you see an ending like seven, it, it sticks with you forever or sticks with you all these, these, these years. Yeah, J- Joss just understands the power of that. It's one of those things where I guess in the first draft of Serenity, everybody was fine and it was set up for Serenity 2. And he just felt it would be much more powerful if the blood hit the fan. (laughs) And I I, I have no idea if there would be a Serenity 2 out there, if it had had a happy everybody is, oh, oh, there's Lando and Wedge and they're the Ewoks dancing (laughs) kind of ending. It's, It's hard to say. So I love Joss Whedon. Yeah, I want Joss Whedon to have my babies. Me too. He is, after all, more attractive in person. (laughs) Wait, that was last week's podcast. I'm referring to things that people don't know. He does have a long forehead, though. Well, I guess that happens when you've got that big a brain. Maybe. There was, I think it was the master plan thing on the Dr. Horrible site where he makes fun of himself like that. You're wondering, wow, that really is a really long forehead. I think I see... Cary Grant and Eva Marie Saint hanging off. <laughs> <laughs> so he knows he's got a long forehead, so that's good. That that's he, good he stuff. Can take himself. But anyways, yes, click on the web link on our show notes. Shoot your browser right on over to Dr. Horrible's website and watch that show. It's great. And if you feel so inclined after having watched it and enjoyed it, you can buy it on iTunes. Uh-huh. <laughs> so that's, you know, coming along. All right. Well, thanks for listening. And uh, we've uh, definitely enjoyed making this podcast. And if you've enjoyed it half as much as we enjoyed making it, then we've enjoyed it twice as much as you. You have derailed. Yeah. We thank you for listening. And uh, once again, this has been Rish Outfield. And Big Anklevich letting you know that there's a big difference between Mostly Dead and All Dead. Mostly Dead is slightly alive. Good night, folks. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Hello, boys and girls. This is Rish Outfield. Hi. Welcome to the Dune Steve, is what you're supposed to say. We say who we are after. Oh. <laughs> we lost ground control. <laughs> yeah, c- commencing countdown engines on. Oh, eat your protein pills. <laughs> and put your helmet on.